you have not seen the full micro short that we just made and we'll be discussing today, check that out in the notes below because why not? This latest micro short was one that we did with very little money and almost no crew. I had Josh and Justin, of course. Then my DP for this one is Daniel Ruth. Daniel also shot my short film Sentinel. He's crazy talented DP. More links for him in the notes. But Daniel was kind enough to also bring out his gear for this one, which was a huge help. Then we had Ryan Polly, who is a great director friend of mine that came out to AC for us, and Ashley and Emily to help with everything else. So this was very much a friends just making something for the the hell of it sort of thing, but why make it? Well, first, why not? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I feel right. better. Second, as I say on the show all the time, you should make as much stuff as you can as often as you can. And although my latest two short films were much larger crews and budget and time spent, there's no reason not to get your hands dirty and do a one day shoot with some friends just to practice. Granted, given that all of us are doing multiple jobs at once on this shoot, and we pulled something like 50 shots in eight hours, the end result doesn't hit the level of quality we could do with more time and proper crew, but with things like this micro short, you are able to test ideas, theories, and educate yourself in a very short time frame with a safety net. One thing I did differently with this one though was to choose the music that I would use for the final film at the very start. So with this project, it all started with the music. To get the tracks I would ultimately be using, I jumped into Musicbed, who also partnered with us on this project. I was looking for something that felt sci-fi and had a driving element since this would be an action sequence. So I added the sci-fi attribute, then driving, and then added cinematic in genre. From there, I got a bunch of stuff that was in the ballpark. And at this point, I didn't write the script yet. I had a general tone and idea in my head. So I scanned through until I found a few tracks that fit the vibe that I was going for. And then I made a playlist with those that I could write too. I've since built that playlist out more. So if you wanna check that out, link in the notes below. But once I had my script, I thought out what I wanted to do with it all visually, created a quick shot list, then, made an animatic. To make this animatic, I just used my iPhone. I'm not trying to make something that looks cool. I mean, they're holding monopods. The idea is just to get something that would convey intention so that I could share it with everyone involved, especially my VFX artists, so that they could flag any potential issues. So after I shot it all, I was able to cut it together again using the tracks I picked off Musicbed. And once I found the core track that I wanted to use, I grabbed some other tracks from that same artist and album so that they would match to give me variation to create a score that would fit our film. And the music that I cut for the animatic ended up being the same cut for the final micro short. But with the music in, I spent 30 minutes adding the most comically terrible temp VFX ever, and we had our animatic.
This was really useful in many ways, especially since it showed me exactly what I was gonna need on what would be a very tight schedule. And I was able to use the actual prop for the drone that we were gonna use in the film since my friend Bill Duran created this great prop from scratch and shot it our way. He designed it in 3D and set those files as well so that we could use those for our VFX in the end, but we'll get to that. He also made the shield handle and Josh's rifle here. This one was a mixture of several toy guns that he had laying around, so it was a kit bashing situation. If you want to know more about how he made these, check out the build video Bill put up on his channel in the notes below. And check out his other videos. He has a ton of amazing prop builds there. But with that done, the next thing to do for pre-production was find where we were actually going to shoot it. And this is run and gun with a very little budget, so that restricts us a lot. And after looking around and coming up short, I mentioned to my DP Daniel what I was looking for, and it turns out his brother owns an amazing place in Denton called Cab Station. It's this old flour mill that they are renovating, but it's still in the early stages and very much has the look we were hoping for. It's actually the same place we shot the Ronin 4D test shots as well, which Daniel also came out to shoot for. So a massive thank you to James Combs for letting us come out and play. They have a great coffee shop over there too, so check that out in the notes as well. But that's a great example of ask. Ask everyone. You never know what you're gonna come up with or who might know someone that could lead you to what you need. But next, it was time to shoot. And again, we are a tiny team knocking out around 50 shots in eight hours. So with that in mind, I had to be smart about what we were shooting shooting and how. So for me, the key elements were going to be available light, reducing or completely eliminating practical elements like practical explosions or makeup, and creating a sequence where Josh and Justin never physically interact and generally stay in the same spots throughout the film. Now, while doing those things help make our day, it also brings in other complications that need to be solved. And it's in those problems that you're gonna find the reason to do things like this. You get to practice creating solutions for these issues while enjoying a nice safety net. There's no massive budget here. There isn't a big crew waiting for the next call. It's just some friends figuring things out. It's really a freeing and fun way to sharpen your skills and learn new ones. But first, let's look at available light, which Daniel is great at. But when going available light, you are at the mercy of the elements. You hope for overcast like we had with Sentinel. This gives an even tone that's easier to match throughout the project. But that's not what we had. We had a very clear blue sky. So this means we are battling the sun's position throughout the day. The biggest difficulty with the sun came when we turned around to Justin's coverage. Behind him, we had these great looking structures, but the problem came with the sun's position. As the day went on, it quickly shifted the shaft of light we positioned Justin in as we shot. So we had to shift Justin with the light as it moved. With the right lensing and composition, you cannot tell at all within the film that these shots are moving further and further away from where we started. With these shots, it was an easy sell to fake those angles, but the big problem came with the shots that we needed with Justin in frame while looking back in Josh's location and the drone underground shots. For the drone underground shots, this moment here is four different shots, all in completely different spots. While I think once you know that, two of the shots don't fully work, but we were able to bend it enough to make it work in the edit for the first go. And again, it showed us how far we could bend this idea. For these overs here, we were in such a different area that I wasn't entirely sure how it would work out at all. But again, we are experimenting with a safety net, so we went for it. If we look at the location from a bird's eye view, this is where Justin is supposed to be and where he starts. Then as the day went on, we shifted down this way. Then for the underground drone moment, those shots were done here, 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 and here. And for the final over, again, he's supposed to be here, but we had him over here. I personally think you could definitely feel the difference in the space. It bugs me how close Josh is now, and the ground is grass on his shots here, but then rock when we're looking over with no sign of grass, but we were able to bend it enough to make it work, though imperfectly. And again, reinforcing a technique for ourselves and experimenting with how far we can push it as long as we keep two main factors in mind, screen direction and light direction. Then our other cheats, no practical elements and never having Josh and Justin physically interact, which for me, raised the biggest and most interesting issue. To stay away from physical elements, I went with the idea of a CG drone and Josh and Justin are just staying in the same position throughout. So how do you make all of that feel connected and exciting? For me, to keep that forward driving feeling for the sequence while staying coherent, it was all about setup, screen direction, and movement. For setup, this is another area I love to experiment with. I do it with all my short films. Can I strip all dialogue away and show you a few subtle things and will that be enough? How far can I take that? It's a great practice in figuring out how to convey information to the audience. How much info do they actually need? And again, 
we have a safety net here. So we set up that Josh is headed toward this large device in the distance, but then there's a bullet hit to the wall next to him as he checks to make sure it's clear. Now I whip pan left right before cutting to Justin, and that whip pan is really key. That movement tells you exactly where Justin is in relation to Josh. Without it, if we just jump to the close up, it would feel a bit disconnected. You wouldn't be completely sure in what direction or height he actually was at. Now for the rest of the film, Justin is on the left and Josh on the right. So Justin will always look toward the right, toward Josh, and Josh toward the left, toward Justin. This will allow us to move fast without having to reestablish our screen direction. Then for movement, once the action kicks off, something is always in motion in every single shot, from the drone flying up, the shield opening, the camera's moves, and so on. Putting as much motion in the frame as I could really helped carry it all through and made it feel energetic. So while we have something that was shot pretty simply, it doesn't feel like that in the end. Then another setup was our drone. Josh hits a button and chucks it into the air, and we take a minute to sit with this thing. This shot specifically mixed with the music and the sound design tells us that this thing is dangerous. And our HUD moment informs us that it's searching for and now targeting Justin. Again, a very simple thing, but making sure we took a solid beat with that drone before moving into everything else. It locks into our mind what this thing is. So we can move fast without needing any more close-ups after that. And of course, I'm able to pull this drone off thanks to the amazing VFX artists I work with, Ryan Thompson and Joey Deutsch. They were able to take the drone model Bill sent over, then texture and animate it in all of our scenes. Joey is using Blender and After Effects, while Thompson did all his CG shots and After Effects using Element 3D. We'll get more into how we did some of the specific VFX later on, especially the shield effect, but for that one, we did have a practical element that helped sell the effect, and that was this handle, which was also made by Bill. For the most part, it was just the handle, but for these slow-mo close-ups, we wanted to have some dirt flying at Justin, so for that, I cut out a small piece of plexiglass and secured that to the handle. Then Joey could remove the plexi, add the shield, and keep the practical dirt. Again, we'll get into the VFX more later on, but if there's anything specific that you want us to cover, drop that in the comments below. And finally, another huge element to get all of this working and feeling cohesive and exciting is of course the sound. For that, I asked my friend Steve Horn if he wanted to play and thankfully he did because he had to replace every bit of sound. On the day that we shot, there was massive construction happening. So all the location sound was useless. So everything you hear in this one was added in post. And Steve is an absolute beast. He did all the post sound for my short, There Comes a Knocking and works at Brute and Stroby doing insane work of all kinds of awesomeness there. And he has a few sound packs on our store as well. So definitely check that out in the notes below. But Steve was able to give weight and tone to the film with the sound that helped sell the event, making the drone feel menacing, placing people and things in the space, and generally bringing it to life. And of course, the music he mixed in was just as important. The music really is our dialogue here. So toying around with where I had it drop out, where and when it built or shifted, all played into getting that final sense of that forward motion for this one and kept it from feeling repetitive. And again, that music was from Musicbed and stayed with the project from script to upload. And I really dug that process. Setting a tone and sticking with it was a refreshing way to work. Discovery is always nice, of course, and there was plenty of that with this process as well. But the music I chose and locked in early on became sort of a backbone for the project as a whole, or I guess a foundation that we built everything else on. So if you're looking for music for your next project, definitely give Musicbed a look. As you've heard from this project, they have amazing stuff there that can be easily tweaked to fit your needs. And again, I do have that sci-fi playlist in the notes below, so give that a look. Another thing we have down in the notes is a credit for all of our wonderful friends who helped us make this one along with their links. So please take a second to give that a look too. But that is it for today. Like I said, more to come on the VFX, but until then, don't forget to write, shoot, edit, repeat.